All right, it's good to be here and uh, appreciate the opportunity of being back in Jackson. Last time I was here, uh, this building wasn't looking like this. It was a concrete pad and kind of a little bit of a structure. So it's been quite a while. And so it's good to be back here. Good to see some old faces as well as some new faces. So I'm very thankful to be here. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, please, if you would, to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, and during the course of this weekend, we will be studying together the epistle of Paul to Timothy, the first epistle of Paul to Timothy. And I'm going to read what I believe to be the key verse uh, just to open uh, our thoughts this evening from chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to be reading from verse 14 down to verse 16. And so it begins this way, 1 Timothy 3, verse 14. It says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And again, God will bless the reading of his precious word to our hearts this evening. So you might ask the question, why this topic and why at this time? And part of their thought is this key verse about how to behave in the house of God. I want to just start with the phrase, the house of God, because during the pandemic that we've all endured for the last couple of years, the government at some point had to assess what they considered to be essential and what they considered to be non-essential. And in their process of making decisions, one of the things that they considered to be non-essential was the house of God. Interesting, liquor stores were considered to be essential, but the house of God wasn't considered to be essential. And I find that very disturbing somewhat, because I believe the house of God is absolutely essential, and essential to people who are going through a pandemic, who need comfort and encouragement, they need the house of God. And and so I think it's been a great tragedy. But I want to just focus on this idea of the house of God this weekend. And one of the things I want to stress, and and as I kind of give it what I think is a definition of what I'm talking about is, I believe why the house of God is so essential is that it is a witness to divine order in the midst of satanic disorder. Now, let me say that again. I think this is a very important statement, a witness to divine order in the midst of satanic disorder. And so if I can explain what I mean by that, in our world, um, it's clearly there's, there's really a great breakdown, isn't there? Everywhere you look, it's a broken world. And in the brokenness of the world, uh, there's a lot of confusion. And that's not from God, because the Bible's clear, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So where's all this confusion coming from? Well, I have no question in my mind that it's satanic in origin. And and so it's got so bad that, uh, as you know, this is not a political statement. This is just a statement of fact, that if a nominee for the Supreme Court in this country can even answer a simple question, what is a woman, we're in serious trouble, right? In other words, what I'm saying is there's such disorder in this world that the world's wisdom is showing itself to be utterly bankrupt at this moment in history. Totally bankrupt. And so the house of God is essential because it's the only place you're going to get the truth. That's why it's so important. So what I want to do is I'm going to give you a little outline of where we'll be going this weekend. And, and, and as I give you the outline of each chapter, kind of the main idea how each chapter relates to the house of God, I'm also wanting to give you a prayer request that goes along with each 
section, okay? Because I think it would be good. It would be good for us to pray in these terms. And I think sometimes we need something practical to take away with us. And I think this would be good and practical for all of us to have a prayer list based on the ministry this weekend. And so the first chapter, chapter one, which I, I delight in looking forward to dealing with, is the house of God and its gospel. The house of God and its gospel. And of course, if we forget the gospel as the house of God, which sadly is happening in some meetings where they call themselves the house of God, but they've forgotten the gospel, then you just become a social club for Christians and you lose your sense of purpose. And so this is important, the house of God and its gospel. And so in the course of thinking about that, I want to ask you to pray that God would raise up a new generation of evangelists who can preach the gospel with clarity in these days of confusion. I think that's so essential. So the house of God and its gospel, that's going to be chapter one. Chapter two is the house of God at prayer. And sadly, even though there's going to be a wonderful chapter, chapter two, unfolding the importance of prayer and the prayer meeting, if we're really honest... The weakest meeting in almost every church is the prayer meeting. It's the Cinderella meeting of the church. It really is. And yet we, we want to look at that and we want to pray, specifically a prayer request, pray for intercessors. Pray that God's people would see the importance of being at the midweek meeting and praying. And seeing the importance of that and, the, and how that affects every other meeting in the church. And so we'll talk about that, the house of God at prayer. And then, of course, there's two things in chapter 2. Because towards the end of chapter 2, it gets into something that our society really is confused and muddled about. But it talks about gender roles. And what's interesting is in the house of God, there's no confusion over gender roles. None. It's absolutely clear, black and white. I mean, it's very clear. And, and so as we look at that section on the house of God and gender roles, we need to pray that people will have a heart of obedience and contentment with the role that God has given to them. You know, it's interesting. Satan's attack on Eve was deliberately designed to cause discontentment. You notice how he approached her? He, he didn't say to her, wow, isn't this amazing? Look at all the trees you get to eat from. Like, I mean, that would be fair and realistic, right? I mean, abundance of options. What does he do? He focuses on the one thing that she can't eat from, the one tree. And it's to make her feel like she's missing out. Instead of saying, look at all your things you can do, right? All the many blessings that you can enjoy, it's, it's the enemy loves to focus on the one thing you can't do. And, and so the, pray for dis, uh, people to be obedient to the word of God and to be content with what God has given as far as roles are concerned. And because we have these gender roles that are taught in chapter two, we move into chapter three and we get the house of God and its government. And the reason we have the house of God and its government is that when you have order, you have to have government. Let me explain what I mean by that. If there's a breakdown of government, what's the result? It's anarchy, right? Okay. So we said there's an order in the house of God. There's gender roles. They're very laid out. They're very clear. And so who's going to maintain that order? Who's going to take responsibility and say, no, I'm sorry, sister, you can't do that, right? Who's going to do that? Well, you have to have government. When you have order, you have to have government. And so in chapter three, you have the house of God and its government. And there's a plurality of overseers who are to oversee at the house of God. And we'll see later on as well in chapter five, they're also to rule in the house of God. Now, not rule as despots, but they're to rule, right? And that means you obey the rules. <laughs> and, and so the house of God and its government. And so we need to pray for shepherds to be raised up by the Holy Spirit who are men, not only of compassion, but men of conviction, 
who will defend the order in the house of God, even when it's not trendy. Because it's not trendy today. It's not popular today. But it's as biblical as it's ever been. And so we need men who will be men of conviction and say, look, this is what God says. And we've got to maintain that order because we don't have to answer to you. We have to answer to God. You see, shepherds, overseers, are stewards that will give an account to the chief shepherd. And one day the chief shepherd's going to come and they'll give an account. And we want them to give an account with joy. We really do. And so we, we, we need men. And so pray for men, shepherds with conviction and compassion. And then chapter 4 is the house of God and the latter days. And it talks about verse 1 of chapter 4. The Spirit speaks expressly in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of demons or devils. And so what we see is that one of the, one of the characteristics of the latter days is there's going to be departure, a lot of people departing from the faith, and, and there's going to be deception from these seducing spirits. And, and so, again, as we think about the house of God, we need to pray for the house of God in the last days that people would be both men of, uh, and women of discernment and also men and women of faithfulness to the Word of God. Because the pressure is on to bail out. That's, it's trendy uh, to, you know, I have a friend, he's an evangelist in England, and he was telling me that uh, he was witnessing to a guy, and uh, the, the man's immediate response was, oh, I'm an atheist. And so he got talking to him, and by the time they'd finished talking, this atheist had asked my friend the evangelist to pray for his girlfriend, to pray for his mother, uh, to pr- you know, and, and all these people, and an atheist is asking him to pray. And what my friend said, which is a very astute comment, he said, 20 years ago in England, if you talk to somebody, they would have said, oh, I'm a Christian, but they really weren't. They really weren't. But the default answer was, I'm a Christian 20 years ago. He said, today in England, the default response is, I'm an atheist, but they're really not. I found that very, very astute, right? And so, but that, that's the way things are today. So um, <clears throat> the house of God in latter days, people of discernment, people of faithfulness. And then in chapter 5, the house of God and its relationships and responsibilities. Uh, looking after one another, caring for one another. Kind of, it's the one another chapter. What do we do with widows? Uh, what do we do with the elderly? How do we relate to one another in the house of God? And it should be a caring community. We should be interested in the well-being of people that are maybe destitute widows or people who are elderly and uh, uh, perhaps need a bit more patience with them in their later years. And so the house of God, its relationship and responsibility. And again, pray for genuine love. The, the, the house of God would be a loving community that we really would love and care for one another, practical. And then chapter six is the house of God and its finances. And it's really about praying for good stewards, that we'd be good stewards of the resources that God blesses us with. So that's kind of the general outline of what we're going to be covering as much as we possibly can. But I want to begin by just talking a little bit of uh, kind of what you say a general overview of some of the key ideas in 1 Timothy. And it's interesting, if ever I'm going to study a passage or, or a book, one of the things that I like to do is read through the book several times and look for the repeated words and phrases. And whatever the Holy Spirit has sought to repeat and emphasize over and over again, we need to pay attention to it. And so as we do this with 1 Timothy, just reminding ourselves a little bit about the background, it's what, what we call a pastoral epistle, uh, not that it's written to pastors, Uh, But these are are called pastoral epistles. And part of the reason is that they were written to these individuals rather than churches. And these individuals, Timothy and Titus, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, I want to suggest to you that they were New Testament troubleshooters. And so basically Paul would go and he's always wanting to go to regions beyond. 
And so he goes and he plants an assembly in a certain location. And, and then he's, he's got to move on. He doesn't stay very long. At longest three years, uh, 18 months at Corinth. But generally speaking, just a few months. And then he's moving on because there's so much virgin territory of which to plant new churches. So that's what Paul does. But, but these churches, uh, they're left behind, and some of them are in a persecution context, like Thessalonians. Uh, some of them, uh, they're very young churches, and false teaching comes in. And so what does Paul do? Does he abandon his mission, or does he have some other plan? Well, he has another plan. He's got these team players who I would call New Testament troubleshooters. And so he sends men like Timothy and Titus to these, these, these young assemblies to correct error and to, to help straighten things out. And so basically that's what these men were, uh, New Testament troubleshooters, following up the work in relatively new assemblies, correcting error, uh, seeing the, uh, the raising up of and recognition of godly leadership. For instance, Titus is left on Crete and part of his mission is to make sure elders are appointed in all the churches and so uh, making sure that they're properly raised up uh, leadership. So all of these things. So particularly in this epistle, uh, we find that Timothy is left behind in Ephesus. So he's in the city of Ephesus. So it's kind of good to know a little bit of the background. Uh, You could have Ephesians in the back of your mind when you consider 1 Timothy, uh, because Ephesus is really the background. This is where he's left. And one of the things that we mentioned is that in the latter days, some are going to depart from the faith. Now, what's interesting is that you can sense in 1 Timothy, it's already happening. So I want to look at the word faith as it occurs in 1 Timothy. And we're just going to run through every reference to faith. And I think we're going to see a pattern here. So for instance, in chapter 1, let's look at verse 5. It says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of good conscience and faith unfeigned or unhypocritical. Or if we want to put it this way, Faith without a mask, because the, the idea of the word hypocrite is somebody wearing a mask. Kind of ironic, isn't it? We're all supposed, we're supposed to mask up, and some of us have been wearing masks for years anyway, uh, in a sense of pretending to be something we're not, right? A hypocrite. And so he said, faith unfeigned is the idea of genuine faith, unhypocritical faith. And then notice what he says. Uh, So the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith unfeigned from which some, having swerved, have turned aside to vain jangling or empty chatter. So already, instead of this unhypocritical faith, he says some have already swerved away. So the very first time faith is mentioned is telling us there are some that have swerved away. They've gone away from the true faith, right? Instead of having this unhypocritical faith, they should have, they've already already gone aside. And we're going to see almost every reference in 1 Timothy to faith is connected with departure from the faith. So it says in verse 19 of chapter 1, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Ironic that Paul, the former blasphemer, has handed them over to Satan so that they would learn not to blaspheme. But again, I want you just to see that that, that already, he says, we need to hold to the faith because some have already made shipwreck. And he gives, and by the way, Paul is not afraid to name names. Sometimes in our evangelical kind of politeness, we're almost afraid to mention names. Paul was not scared to mention names. And he names these guys. He said, these guys have made shipwreck. They're a disaster. They're, they're, we'd say they're a train wreck. They're a shipwreck. They're, they're just an absolute disaster. And they've departed from the faith. Now, we'll we'll go into more details. I want to just do the general before we get into the specific. But I want you just to see the the point. Chapter 4, verse 1. We've already looked at this, but 
The Spirit speaks expressly, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. And so again, here are people that have already giving heed to these, these doctrines of devils. They've departed from the, the faith already as he's writing. Chapter 5 and verse 8. But if any provide not for his own house, uh, own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That's very challenging, isn't it, in our day? Don't you think? Do you see a bit of a challenge there? It's kind of interesting. You go to India, and the brethren there would never dream of putting their parents into a nursing home. They would see that as denying the faith. I mean, they take it really seriously. That's, that's how serious they are. They're, they're serious about taking their... They're, they're, and, and a lot of them, they'll, they'll build a, a section on their house and they'll take in their aging parents. And, and so here we just get this idea that uh, a denial of the faith is worse than an infidel. The idea is that an unbeliever in those days would do that. And again, I wonder how much we're shaped by the culture rather than by the scriptures. And I'm talking about even in sound evangelical churches. How much is the culture shaping our thinking and how much is the scripture shaping our thinking? And so he says, they denied the faith. Uh, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 12, he says, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. Speaking of younger widows who were, I guess, a bit flighty and uh, not content to wait for God to provide and they went looking. And uh, he says, these have cast off their first faith. <clears throat> Chapter uh, 6 and verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So again, people have erred from the faith. Uh, Chapter 6, verse 21, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. So we've not, this is not rocket science. All we've simply done is we've, we've paid attention to the repeated ideas the Spirit of God has given in this epistle. And one of the repeated ideas is that of faith. But it's not sincere faith. It's not the real, it, it's people bailing out. It's people departing. It's what we call apostasy, right? That is the background and that's why Timothy is there in Ephesus, because there's a lot of departure. Does it sound a little bit like our day in any way, do you think? I think it sounds a lot like the day we find ourselves in. That's why these epistles are so relevant, because there's a lot of people bailing out. Because it's not trendy to be Christian anymore in this godless culture. What are some of the things that threaten faith, by the way? I just wanted to uh, kind of think about that because obviously faith is, is being abandoned. So what are some of the things behind it? One of the things that he emphasizes quite a bit is the idea of foolish questions or questions that are speculative. And so in chapter one, verse four, he says, neither give heed to fables, endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. And so not there's anything wrong with having a Q and A session. We're gonna do that. But sometimes people love to deal with speculative questions. And they, there's a love of the novel. I don't know if you noticed that, but, but in our day, there's uh, what I call YouTube theology. And so there are Christians that, you know, I hope I'm not offending anybody, flat earth theorists and all this kind of stuff. And like, you don't get that from reading the scriptures. You get that from watching a YouTube documentary that kind of looks semi-credible. And, and, so, and so that's what's happening. That's, that's it. This is, I, I'm talking about people in assemblies I'm talking about, not, not out there in, in La La Land, even in our circles, but people are caught up with speculative questions rather than just being grounded in the faith. The simplicity that's in Christ. There are all this other stuff. Be careful of YouTube theology. And I know I've got a whole channel on YouTube. And I'm, <laughs> I, hopefully that's safe. But, uh, just, uh, but be careful of these things. 
And so this idea of questions, you, you get the same thing in chapter 6 again. And verse 4, it says, He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railing, evil surmisings. And so there are some people that ask questions, and, and I love it. They're genuine. They want to know what the Scripture says and how they can live it out. And I'm, I'm all for that. I'm all for those. But there are other people that like to ask questions because they want to show themselves to be some smart cookie and make you trip you up and seem clever or whatever. And, and it's just pride is the, is the root of it all. And so he says the questions, these can, these can be a really difficult thing. A second thing that uh, threatens faith is a wrong use of the law. Uh, we see this in chapter 1, verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. One of the ways that people depart from the faith is they get caught up in legalism and law stuff. Uh, dietary fads, that's a big thing, isn't it? Uh, I, I meet people sometimes, and they'll, they'll tell me quite boastfully, oh, I don't eat pork anymore. As if, well, it might make you more healthy, but let me tell you something, it doesn't make you more holy at all. That net in Acts chapter 10, I'm pretty sure there was a big hog in that net. Probably barbecued, right? It was, I mean, it was ready to eat. Rise, kill, and eat. I've never eaten it. And so now these legalistic, and people love to bring you back to bondage to the law. And, and it, it causes people to lose the simplicity of the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Don't allow that to happen. Wrong use of the law. Um, the health, wealth, gospel. That certainly caused a lot of people to bail out when they see this. Chapter 6 and verse 5. Uh, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. The whole God channel, right? Let me tell you something. From such withdraw yourself, right? Because it's all, vast majority is health, wealth, gospel nonsense, isn't it? You know, give us, you know, give us $100 and the Lord will give you back $1,000, right? You've heard those things. And, and it's right here, right in Timothy's days, people saying gain is godliness. Well, where does that leave the Lord Jesus? Right. Like in terms of gain, he had nowhere to lay his head. When it came to paying taxes, he had to say to Simon, you know, catch a fish. And from the fish's mouth, the taxes will be paid. He, he was supported by women who ministered to him in, in Luke chapter 8. Right? He, he did not have anything. He, though he was rich, yet for our sakes, he became poor. And so if gain is godliness, the Lord Jesus evidently wasn't godly. What about the Apostle Paul? Yeah, sometimes he said, I know what it is to, to abound. And there were times when he was treated like royalty. But he says, I know how to be abased. And there was times he was treated despicably. Was he godly? Sure he was, right? And so, again, just to, to see, this is, again, one of the snares. Another snare, and I believe that th this is all so clearly inspired uh, by the Spirit of God and so up to date. Look at chapter 6, verse 20. Or oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. How many people have abandoned the faith because of science falsely so-called? Right? The whole theory of evolution, and I like to call it what it is, evil-ution, it's, it's from the pit. It really is. Did God not know how he was going to make his world? that he needed these extra millions of years to make it work? God spoke the world into existence. I believe in six 24-hour days, and on the seventh day, he rested, was done, a finished work. And I believe that, and I believe that, that things like theistic evolution, I believe, are undermining the faith not supporting the faith. 
Because what it's telling us is that the Bible isn't sufficient. It needs so-called scientific theories to make it work. And I don't believe it needs that. And so we've got to, again, just see, these are some of the things that we're facing in our day. But behind it all, as we saw in chapter 4, are seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And I have to remind myself, you know, I, I must say, I, I'm deeply troubled about, about America right now. And not because I'm, I'm a great patriot or anything like that, but, but I, I just see the culture imploding, and I find it very difficult. And part of it is, I, I really believe that there's such satanic deception today and such confusion, and that's from him. So you don't, you don't even know what's true anymore in terms of the media. Like, who do you believe anymore? Who is actually telling the truth? One person says this, another person says that. Both seem to be credible, and they're contradicting each other. And you end up thinking, I don't know who to believe. Well, I can tell you who you can believe. God and his word. Why is the house of God essential? It's the only place you're going to find the truth in our bankrupt world. I don't think you're going to find the truth in universities anymore. And in fact, probably for a long time, you're not going to get truth in universities. Right? You're not going to get truth, sadly, even in kindergarten anymore. So where are you going to find truth? Why is the house of God so important? It's the only place in this bankrupt society where you're going to get the truth. The only place. And behind it, you see, is this satanic deception. And that's what it is. He's a liar. The father of lies. He's a deceiver. That's what he does. And he does it well. And he's had plenty of practice. And, and he's doing it. And he's got, uh, he's, he's the prince of the power of the air. And may I suggest the prince of the power of the airwaves as well. And all this stuff is going out. And it is just undermining the faith. So what's, what's Paul's solution? It's one thing to say we've got this major problem. There's all this departure. It's right here in 1 Timothy. So what does Paul say about this apostasy, this departure, this widespread departure? Well, again, we're going to look at some of the key words. And one of the key words that you're going to see over and over again in 1 Timothy is doctrine. Doctrine. Sound doctrine. The word sound, key word in the pastorals, it's used frequently. And the word sound means hygienic or healthy. It's actually the, the Greek word is from which our English word hygiene comes from. Okay, so we, we think about being hygienic, being, being clean, all the rest of it. Well, sound doctrine, the idea is health-giving doctrine. In all this world of corruption and, and, if you like, spiritual poison, here's something that is very healthy. Here's something that is solid, that is, that is going to make you well in this whole scene of sickness. And that's why, by the way, we talked about the house of God being the pillar and ground of the truth. We'll, we'll expand on that, Lord willing, tomorrow. But it's good to know that this is the place where the truth is both supported and defended. It's the pillar and ground of the truth and proclaimed. So let's look through 1 Timothy and think about doctrine. And so chapter 1, verse 13, we're just, again, looking at these, these key words that are repeated over and over again. And, sorry, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And so obviously there was a doctrine that was held and believed in the, in the early church. And Timothy is told that anybody that comes with any other doctrine, he is to charge them not to do it. Don't, don't bring any other doctrine here than, than that which is already received and believed and accepted. Right? And so it, part of his charge is to make sure that they teach no other doctrine. Uh, chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Uh, 
So again, you've got this idea of healthy doctrine, and it's kind of interesting, the context of all this disobedience, lawlessness, and what it would tell us is this, that actually wrong doctrine leads to wrong living, right? It really does. Wrong doctrine leads to wrong living. Right doctrine leads to right living. And so uh, he mentions, again, this importance of doctrine. Look at chapter 4 now, please. Chapter 4 and verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So if you want to be a good minister, and that word minister simply means servant, a good diakonos, it's the word that's used elsewhere as deacon. You want to be a good diakonos of the word, a good servant of the word, he says, uh, of, of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. And so again, the importance of good doctrine. Chapter 4, verse 13, he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. To, to hold the fort till I get there, Timothy, you make sure you give attention to the public reading of Scripture. That's the idea, to reading. It's not just reading good books, although that's a good thing to do, but it's the public reading of Scripture, to exhorting the saints, to obedience to the Scriptures, and then to doctrine, to teaching. And of course, doctrine is not a scary word. It just simply means the apostolic teaching. Apostles' doctrine is simply the apostles' teaching. But give attention to doctrine. <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And so by paying attention to the doctrine, Timothy's going to save himself from what? From making shipwreck like others, like Alexander and Hymenius have, you know, to, so that you're going to finish strong and finish well. Uh, you'll save yourself if you take heed to the doctrine, and also you will save those that hear you. And, and so again, take heed. Chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine, right? Give special honor to these people that have devoted themselves to the study and the presentation of the word of God to the saints. Honor them for that. Uh, that what they're doing is a good thing. And notice it says labor in the word and doctrine. And one thing it tells us, it's work. It is work to, to master the scriptures, but one of the things about mastering the scriptures is you don't ever master the scriptures, the scriptures master you, really. That's the way it works, right? It's, it, it has an effect on you. But, but again, he, he emphasizes how important it is. Chapter 6, verse 1, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And so in Roman Empire, of course, there were lots of slaves, lots of servants. And so a Christian servant is told that he needs to conduct his business in such a way as a slave that he would cause God's doctrine not to be blasphemed, not to be treated with disdain. And, and again, by way of imp implications for us, a Christian should be the, the best kind of employee that there, there are, right? In other words, I'm working for another boss. I, I may have my secular boss, and you know, sometimes the mentality in the workplace is, well, when the boss is not watching, let me tell you something, your boss is always watching, yeah. right? Because you, you have a, a boss who's always watching. It never sleeps and never leaves the office or wherever you work. And so we're to, we're to serve the Lord's Christ. That's who we're to serve in the workplace. And so we can adorn the doctrine rather than causing the doctrine to be blasphemed. That's very challenging, isn't it? Do, do I cause people to look negatively of Christians by the way I work? Do they, they reject the, the teaching of the Bible by my work habits? Wow, that kind of makes your workplace a different scenario, doesn't it? Do I work in such a way that I actually cause people to be drawn to the Savior or repulsed from the Savior? 
chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Now, we're going to focus quite a bit on godliness because that's the next key word in Timothy. But this is a good place to, to end in our doctrinal discussion because what he says is that actually, if anybody teach otherwise, consent not to wholesome words. Again, this idea of sound, hygienic words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, you can't go far wrong than teaching the words of the Lord Jesus. That's healthy. That's hygienic. That, that's going to do you good. But he says, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Now, here's the point, and I want to make this point quite clear if I can, and that is this, that we said that good doctrine, if it's taught properly, will lead to good behavior. It will produce godliness, right? That The product of the doctrine will be godly living. And so that's a good thing to ask. Is that what we're producing in our assemblies? In our assemblies are people living victorious Christian lives and living godly lives that are well-pleasing to the Lord. Because if they're not, we might need to examine our doctrine. Right? Because it should produce something. It should produce a godliness of life and character in the people that hear it. And so again, we can, we can be doctrinally correct, but if our life is not affected by it, then there's something missing. There's something wrong. And so it needs to affect our lives. Am I living holier today than I did five years ago? I hope I am. I am. Because if not, the doctrine has not done me a lot of good. If I'm worse than I was five years ago, the doctrine is deadly. Right? It's not working. And so godliness, very important idea. And of course, it's an amazing thought, you know, what do we mean by godliness? Because that's one of the great themes in this epistle, isn't it? We, we said when we read the key verses, chapter 3, verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And so if we think of ungodliness, uh, somebody who's ungodly is somebody who doesn't bring God into the equation of life at all. So the ungodly gets up in the morning, and he, he may not be uh, a, a wife beater. He may not be uh, hooked on pornography. He may not be, you know, he may be a, a, a relatively moral person, but he's ungodly because he doesn't bring God into his life at all. So he eats his Wheaties in the morning or his sausage McMuffin with egg, and he never acknowledges God's provision. There's no thanksgiving whatsoever. He goes about his work. He doesn't ask help from God at all. It's like God doesn't exist. The ungodly just don't bring him into the picture. He's not in the picture. They get in their car, they drive, they don't ask for safety or protection. Uh, they, in fact, the only time they probably ever mention God is if they get mad, and then they'll, they'll blame God or curse God or whatever. But generally speaking, God is not in the equation. And so godliness is somebody who wants God in everything in their lives. He's sent a stage, right? Everything I do, everything I think about, it's for the glory of God. I, I want him everywhere. I want, and why would I not? When I realize what Christ has done for me, why would I want to keep God out of any area of my life? This God is so amazing, so gracious, so marvelous in what he's done for me and sending his son to die for me. I want him sent a stage. That's where he belongs. I don't want to keep him at a distance. I want him in everything. I want him in my relationships. I want him in my marriage. I want him in my home. I want him in my children's lives. I want him in the workplace. I want him in every area of life. And I'm not going to keep him out. I want him because of what he's done. He's so worthy. And so a godly life is a life that is just centered in God. <laughs> That's what it is. God is everything to this person. And it has the idea of piety towards God. A mindset that is well-pleasing to God, devoted to God, an attitude that reveres Him, that seeks to do that which is well-pleasing in His sight, that, that just longs for God to be glorified. And so, <clears throat> of course, we need to know more about God to know what pleases Him. 
But again, I want to just go through quickly. We've, we're, we're, we've got a minute to go, and I'm just going to quickly run through the godliness ones. Now, just to see that, all I want us to see is that these key ideas run all the way through. There's a departure from the faith. The, the solution is sound doctrine. And that sound doctrine should produce godliness. And so let's just quickly look. It won't take too long. 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, the prayer meeting. It says we're to pray for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And so we'll develop this more tomorrow, but part of the reason we want a peaceful and quiet life is not so we can pursue the American dream, but so we can be godly. That's why we want to live a peaceful and quiet life. So the conditions are conducive for godly living, for, for living for God. And it's, we're not uh, struggling to find out how am I going to survive tomorrow in difficult times when there's anarchy and all these things. So we pray for kings uh, and all the rest of it. Chapter 2, verse 10. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works? And so he's talking about the women, and he's talking about the fact that certain things in them that are, are kind of a, a testimony of godliness. Uh, not long ago, I read a, a great story of a Scottish woman called Mrs. Binney. And Mrs. Binney was in Edinburgh, and she had every belief that God was going to bring a revival to Edinburgh. And she was correct. There was a great revival came uh, through a guy called Joseph Kemp, who was a preacher in Edinburgh. And one thing that it, she was described in these words, a woman who lived in habitual communion with God. Wouldn't you love to be called that? I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody said, oh, Sister So-and-so, <laughs> she's a woman who lives in habitual communion with God. <laughs> You think she's a woman that professes godliness? I, I think she does, doesn't she? Mrs. Binney made it. <laughs> she was a woman who professed godliness. And so, wonderful to see that. Of course, our key verse, great, is the mystery of godliness. And of course, it's a tremendous de de declaration of the Lord Jesus. God was manifest in the flesh. If you want to know what godliness looks like, uh, here, here's this life. This is the life to model it on. If you want to know what godliness is, just watch this life from its coming into the world uh, to its ascent from the world. Watch that life. That's what godliness looks like. The life of the Lord Jesus. The perfect life of godliness. Chapter 4 and verse 7 he says, but refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable to all things. The word exercise there, we know it well. It's the word gymnasio, from which we get our English word gymnasium. And so the idea is this. Uh, we might put it this way. Discipline yourselves towards godliness. Right? Just as you'll never get the ideal physique if you never do any work in the gym, right? You go to the gymnasium to get the physique you're looking for. I don't know anything about that. I'm just, I've heard that's what they do, right? I, I've never been to one of those places, but I understand that's the idea that goes on there, right? You go there, you, you do your exercises, you get your abs and all this kind of stuff. And, and, you, and you never drift into that physically uh, kind of, I don't know what, perfect body. You, know, you just don't, it doesn't happen overnight. You don't just go to bed having had a big double cheeseburger and wake up the next morning and suddenly you're, you know, Mr. Universe. It doesn't work that way, right? You've got to work at it. And same way with godliness, he says you have to go to the spiritual gymnasium if you want to be godly. In other words, godliness is the result of a disciplined life disciplined prayer life, a disciplined devotional life, a disciplined witnessing life, disciplined to share the gospel with others, a disciplined uh, life of spending time in communion with God, not just uh, reading the word of God but, and praying, but just enjoying his fellowship. There's, there's a discipline that produces godliness. And, and it's not instant. 
It's a disciplined life. And it's interesting, if I could just put it this way, just as you'll never drift into having the perfect body, you will never drift into a life of godliness. In fact, if I could say this, if you drift, it'll always be away from the Lord and never towards the Lord. Because that's what happens. The minute you begin to drift, <laughs> you go away, not towards. So if you want to be godly, there has to be a discipline that characterizes your life. And Tiernis Wilson, great missionary, went to Angola. I think there was no assemblies when he arrived. When he left, there was 1,500 assemblies. God used him marvelously in Angola. One of the things that he said was, <clears throat> when he went to the mission field, he took a big study Bible and a bigger alarm clock. And he said, that's how he got to be the man he was. And he didn't make the alarm clock close enough to just hit it on snooze. It was probably, you know, when he went there, it was probably one of those wind-up ones with bells. But that's how he got to be the man of God he was. It was a disciplined and a dependent life, but a disciplined life. And so he says, discipline yourself to godliness. And so we certainly need to recognize that. We've seen about uh, doctrine which is according to godliness. Uh, chapter 6, almost done, verse 5. He says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw yourself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. That is so counter American culture, isn't it? The whole culture is designed to cause you to be discontented. Every advertisement that is on the television is designed to make you discontent with what you have. That car that you were perfectly happy with, ah, but this year's model has this bell and this whistle that yours doesn't have, right? And, and so, isn't it wonderful to meet somebody who's a godly person and they're content? Because it's, it's radical in our culture of acquisition to meet somebody who's content. And, of course, there was no more godly and contented man than the Lord Jesus. He, he says that his lot had fallen unto him into pleasant places. <clears throat> Verse 11 of chapter 6, it says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Follow after, pursue, make these things the things that you pursue, Timothy. You pursue righteousness. Uh, now, he's already declared righteous, but righteousness is a way of life. Godliness, pursue that. Faith, uh, your increasing confidence in God. Love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith. And so he says, these are things that we should pursue. And so all we've done so far, and really you're getting an idea of what we're going to be doing over this weekend is, we're really going to be doing a thematic approach to 1 Timothy. We're just looking at the major themes. By the end of it, you'll have a good grasp, I hope, of 1 Timothy, but I hope you're already getting something here. Doctrine, very important. Why? Because of apostasy, because people are departing from the faith. And we need sound, healthy doctrine, and we need the kind of doctrine that is going to produce godly living. Right? That is... First Timothy, in a nutshell. Now, there's a lot more to it. You have to come back tomorrow and get the rest of the story. But at least you see that this is a major idea and very relevant to our times because we're living in days of departure. We don't want to lose anybody else. So how are we going to keep them? Well, it's not by entertainment. We're going to keep them by sound, healthy, hygienic doctrine and doctrine that will produce godly living. May God help us. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful for the Word of God because even though this epistle was written at this stage 
uh, many centuries ago, and yet it's speaking to our day in our world. And Father, we just, we just love the Word of God. There's no other book like this that is so dynamic and so real and so life-changing. And Father, we do pray that that might be true of us, that although we're living in a culture of departure, a culture where people are abandoning the faith, that, Lord, we, through sound doctrine, might indeed live lives that will remind people of you in this corrupt, bankrupt world, that we'd have that godliness that is seen in us, uh, that uh, we might be like that lady, Mrs. Binney, who it was said she lived in habitual communion with God. Oh, Lord, what a compliment it would be if somebody said that about us. And yet, Lord, we know we'll never drift into being a Mrs. Binney. Uh, it's going to take definite time set aside to enjoy your presence. So encourage us with these things, we pray. Continue to bless, especially throughout this whole conference. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.